All right, let's get rolling. Welcome to the seventh and final session of the extracurricular inside of TDX. This is our community content here at the conference. So this is all community originated content. We collected submissions for speakers and panelists and we uh, went through them and did interviews and selected talks and helped them make their talks better. We did dry runs and reviewed them and tried to get them better. Uh, so this is all community built and Salesforce has allowed us to have this space to put on this content for the last two days. These are different than your typical talk that you're used to. So I'm gonna take a few minutes here to just explain what you're about to experience. These are long format. We're in here for about an hour and a half, almost two hours. And what we're trying to do is to artificially replicate something that happens very organically, which is the sort of hallway conversations you get into at conferences where you get a chance to talk to a peer that's done something really interesting and you're kind of learning about a hard project they've been part of. And they say, oh, I did this crazy thing, you'd never believe it. You know, I mashed up these four things and, and here's what I do with Salesforce. You go, oh, that's really great, tell me more about it. You kind of pick the problem apart and understand the shape of what they did. And this is a chance to try to take that concept and distill it down into a session. So each of these sessions is sort of a no slides or light slides focus on uh, a technical problem that someone solved, right? These are real world scenarios. And we're gonna walk through uh, this complex problem, kind of peel it back layer by layer. So picture an onion. And we're gonna start out with layers at, and go deeper and deeper and deeper over the course of the whole period of time. And this is a conversation, this is conversational learning, which is something that's really necessary when you get to a, a more advanced level of capacity. You hit a ceiling on what you can do by learning, by reading books or looking at code, uh, and it's hard to get to that sort of upper level of ability without sitting and talking to a human being that's done it before. And you say, hey, how did you do this? Where did you get stuck? And when you got stuck, how did you get around it? And having an opportunity to sit with someone and learn from them is rare. We're trying to make it less rare by putting those people in the front of a room for you so that you can have a conversation with, conversation with them as a group. So really this is a conversation that we're all about to have. And the bulk of the session, the point of the session is the Q&A, right? The Q&A is not an afterthought, it is the session. So what we're gonna do here is Charlie's gonna explain about his app that he built. And he's gonna sort of set up context for us for 20 minutes and just sort of say, hey, here's what I did. And then we're gonna spend about 45 minutes going through and talking about that idea, right? That thing that he built and all the things adjacent to it. In addition to that, we have uh, kind of a warm up act here. We call them quick talks. And I'm gonna have two five minute talks that are just cool things that someone did or knows about or is interested in that they think you would like to hear about. So just two cool things, five minutes each, and then we'll get into our main session. Okay? So, uh, oh, and by the way, my name is Chuck Liddell. Forgot to say that. And I'm one of the organizers. I really appreciate everybody coming out, especially folks that have been through multiple sessions. Who are my uh, three or more extracurricular sessions people? Wow. Four or more? No. Five? Okay. <laughs> All right. Our first quick talk today. Oh, by the way, I have buttons. If anyone wants extracurricular buttons, come find me. I keep forgetting to say that. Um, all right, the first quick talk today is Matt Lacey. Matt is the co-founder and head of development at Proximity Insight, an ISV OEM partner providing in-store solutions for luxury retailers. Matt also code hosts the Sporadic Code Coverage Podcast and is a moderator on the Salesforce Stack Exchange. All right, take it away, Matt. Yeah, by Sporadic, that means maybe two or three episodes a year. Yeah, it's a bit random. Uh, I want to thank Chuck for putting all this on first as well and the, other, and the extended team. Uh, I was a speaker at one of the extracurricular talks last year, and it was very enjoyable just from my point of view because I spent probably an hour, well, 20 minutes talking and then an hour asking other people questions and just listening to the audience. And we got a heap out of that one. It was good fun. Uh, but today I'm just going to very, very quick talk. This can is fully unrehearsed. As you can see, I'm zooming out. Um, I did submit to do a quick talk. Chuck rejected me. And then I was, I think I was sitting in the lounge at LAX having a bloody Mary. And he said, hey, saw an email saying, hey, can you do one after all? I was like, yeah, no worries, we got it. Um, so I'm going to talk about a tool I found very recently called Tab9. That's T-A-B-N-I-N-E, and you can get it at tab9.com. And it's language agnostic autocomplete. Um, I'd love to tell you how it works. Uh, I'm going to say it works with magic. It's 
it definitely is deterministic. It's using some uh, neural networks and things underneath. I believe it looks at symbols and pairs of symbols to see what orders they come in, tries to genericize things and help you write your code. It doesn't know anything, like I say, it's language agnostic. It doesn't know anything about your language. It doesn't know anything about methods available or classes or anything like that. It just looks at your code and extrapolates from there, which is why it can work in any language. It's a very weird and interesting tool. The developer says it'll save you time. At this point, I'm unconvinced, because every time it does something that's magic, I have a bit of a wait what, and then I delete what I just did, and I type it again to watch it, and then I do it again and again, and I try different things. So I end up spending more time just playing around with it than actually coding. But it, yeah, the, I've been using it for a couple of months now. And a lot of the time, I'm it's sort of pretty indistinguishable from any other autocomplete. It's finding my methods and filling them for me. But just, yeah, occasionally it does something where it just blows your mind, because it's just doing magic. Uh, but I encourage everyone to check it out. Uh, like I say, it's language agnostic. I keep saying that. What it means, though, is it's not passing this code. It doesn't understand this code. It's just l looking purely at text symbols that appear throughout the code base. So I'm going to start doing stuff um, down the bottom here, somewhere where it's actually you know, illegal to write code. This wouldn't compile or anything like that. It doesn't care. It's not looking for like, semantic completeness or syntax checking or anything like that. Um, and yeah, it's definitely deterministic. But there's this element of magic, which means I can't necessarily always make it do what I want it to do. So hopefully this will work. Hopefully we'll see some cool stuff. Uh, but I'll try a few different examples and we'll see what happens here. So I'm going to do something first. Uh, it's pulled up first name because that tells where I'm OK based. I don't really want to show that particularly. But I'm going to say it's creating a variable. And say I've got a, um, I'm using like dynamic apex. And I'm pulling values out of an S object using the getter and setter and everything else. Uh, so I'm going to say like my record, I do dot get. I'm going to put first name in here. Pretty sort of standard pattern, maybe. Uh, I'm going to start typing the second line. I'll do last name. You'll probably find that in my code. Uh, I cannot type today. Let's do my record. It's sort of getting you know bits here and there. But see, it's just pulled up last name there. It's genericized from the line above. It's all first name here and first name there. And even though one is a string, one's a variable name. It's just looking at the text content and say, oh, hang on, I could put that in there and complete that line. By the time you get to the like, third example of it, it's usually getting pretty good. You see that bottom completion? It's, yeah, stuff like that. <laughs> stuff that other autocomplete tools don't do. And like I said, this knows nothing about the language. It doesn't know what's going on underneath. Uh, I'm going to leave that line half baked, um, again, because it doesn't care about syntax and things. I've got a lot of setters and getters and classes. Like everybody has that. Uh, something. This is a common pattern elsewhere in my code, so it's already pulling this stuff up. Uh, there's a method in here, like update item, get order cause. You can do stuff like this. I give it two letters out of that. I've given it the lowercase g and the uppercase o of the get order, and it's like, hey, you probably want to type get order cause there. So there's a lot of this funky magic going on. Um, and then one that blew me away the other day, and it's the last example I can make reliably happen, was when it started doing stuff over multiple lines. And that really kind of confused me and threw me off for a moment. Uh, everybody calls test.startTest. If you're writing a text me uh, test method, you're probably going to write test.stopTest next and then space it apart. And because it's just looking at pairs of symbols and the orders they come in, if I start doing it again, it's like, oh, start test. Stop test. So like I say, it's basically magic. I encourage everyone to go and check it out. It's free. There's a free version uh, that will work with up to 400 kilobytes of source code. And it doesn't mean if you've got more than 400 kilobytes, it will stop working. It just means it's only going to look at 400 Ks worth of text and symbols at any given time and throw out old results. Uh, the developer charges, I think it was $49 for a lifetime uh, purchase. And that can support up to 100 megabytes of code or something. Yeah, all built with Rust, which is a really cool programming language that I want to learn a lot more about, and Magic. And we have seven seconds to go, so there we are. What was the name again? Tab 9. Uh, it's a plugin, I should mention this, it's a plugin that's available for Sublime Text, uh, VS Code, Vim, and I think a few others. Like, he just keeps adding extra stuff, so. All right, thank you, Matt. Very cool. All right, all right that was Tab 9, T-A-B 9. David Cohen is our next quick talk. David is a 12x certified developer for Lane 4. 
a Toronto-based consulting firm and app exchange partner. His kitchen table is the Montreal headquarters. He also likes bacon, corn on the cob, and a cinnamon spread that was discontinued, possibly for health reasons, but it was delicious, so who cares? This is David's first time presenting in public, so if he gets sick, apologizes in advance to everyone sitting in the front. Uh, hiya. So unlike, uh, well, just like the last talk, I'm also uh, unprepared, but I'm really unprepared and not fake unprepared like you clearly were. <laughs> you know? So if everyone could just say, don't panic. Perfect. <laughs> um, okay, so first I just want to thank the extracurricular team for having me here today. Um, so here goes nothing. Uh, but a year and a bit ago, I decided I had to get on the whole lightning bandwagon uh, thing or else I was going to fall behind. Um, so I did all the trailhead stuff, the super badges, uh, whatever there was. But I decided that wasn't enough, and I wanted to give myself a project to really dig into it and force myself to learn. Uh, but I couldn't think of anything. So instead, I decided I'm going to take something that's already out there, and I'm going to try to make it better. Now, there are a lot of uh, query building tools out there for Salesforce. Uh, the Workbench was, of course, my go-to reference. Uh, but the Workbench is built in PHP, and I wondered why are none of these tools actually built in Salesforce? So that's what I decided to do, and here's what I came up with. The Query Builder 9000, very much a work in progress. Uh, so the login page that you're seeing here is a Node.js app. It's hosted on Heroku, uh, though to keep it Salesforce-y, I am using the Lightning style sheets. Uh, everything else after this point is 100% native uh, Salesforce Lightning app. Uh, before I log in, it's worth noting, I wrote this first in the old Aura framework last year. Uh, and like the very next week when I finally finished it, uh, Salesforce came out with Lightning Web Components. So <laughs> I converted the whole thing to LWC as a way to learn that. Um, now one of my primary goals for this was to have more or less the same user experience uh, when you're, uh, as Workbench. You just uh, go to a website, you log in, you install nothing. Uh, but for it still to work inside of Salesforce. But Salesforce locks everything down. Uh, you can't just go out and call APIs from Salesforce. You need remote site settings. You need named credentials. Uh, so I'll get to that in a second. So here we go. So I'm going to log into my connected app. It's going to ask me for the basic uh, authorization. I'm going to say allow. OK, now I logged in using standard OAuth, but there's a lot more that just happened here. Like I said, this is a native Lightning app. It's running it right now in my dev org and coming to you through Lightning Out. So what happens is after you connect to your org, behind the scenes, I actually log into mine. I take the instance URL and the access token that comes back from your initial login response, and I pass it to my app. Now that I have the instance URL, I can use the metadata API to create a remote site setting that I need uh, to make the callouts. And then that, along with the access token, lets me connect to your org and query away. So apart from the extra hoop I have to jump through to create the remote, the remote site setting, the rest of the connection works just like Workbench or any of the other tools. Uh, so for the most part, it looks just like your standard query building tool. You can pick your object. So let's say we pick contact. Where are you, contact? Uh, you can pick your fields. So let's do email. And let's say last name. You could switch between uh, API names and labels. A lot of people don't know the API names. So there we go, back and forth. Um, and I could add fields manually. So let's say I go to, oh, where did my, did I unclick last name? There we go. So I can also add fields manually. So let's say um, ID, uh, let's say first name. Now, unlike, um, some of the other tools out there that when you want to go back and forth and go back to start clicking fields, uh, what happens normally is it can't reconcile what you've clicked versus what you've typed. So you kind of lose what you've typed. So if I went here, but my tool that works a little differently, let's say I added last modified date, it doesn't screw up what you've already typed into the box. And let's say for fun, I'm going to add first name, even though I've already typed first name. It's going to catch it. It's going to put it, it's going to reformat it, and you're not going to have to have, you're not going to have that field in there twice. Um, now, while existing tools allow you to query relationship fields, uh, none, as far as I know, uh, show you what those fields actually are. You just have to know. Well, not anymore. So let's go up and add some account fields. We're going to go up to account, and it's going to expand all our account fields. So we'll say, you know, account billing country. 
And let's go up another level to account owner, which is created by. So we'll do created by, we'll say created by uh, email, whatever. Uh, and now let's run the query. So let me scroll down here. Now, lightning's got to be snappy, uh, so I only grab the first 200 results, but I store the next, uh, next records URL, which Salesforce gives you when you use their REST API. And I throw in some nifty infinite scrolling. Uh, there's no pagination here. And when you get near the bottom, I use that next records URL to query the next 200 records, and so on and so forth. So the list just keeps going until you see everything you want to see. Um, also worth noting, I'm not using the lightning data table tag for the results or a tree grid or anything like that. They just weren't friendly enough to do what I wanted them to do. So I actually build the entire results table manually. It's, it's a very long string and I inject it into an empty div. That took time to figure out. Um, one kind of neat thing is how I actually get all the fields. Uh, Cause it takes too long to grab every single field from every object off the top. You call like get global describe and it's going to cut you off. Um, so actually I cache each field as I get them and every time you query an object I store the fields for later that you've already used so it's, it's going to be really fast after. Uh, and I'm out of time, right? So I'm out of time. The address is querybuilder9000.herokoapp.com. Uh, feel free to give it a try. There's still some things that don't work great. It's not perfect, but it's getting there. I've got some deployment fish stickers I could hand out to people after if they'd like them. And uh, thank you very much. All right. Mm. Thank you, David. So uh, those were our quick talks. They're just five-minute talks. They're fun. A uh, chance to show something cool. And if you're interested in doing one, uh, come find us for next time. Great chance for someone that's a first-time speaker to just get up there and show something. No Q&A. It's not too scary. So happy to give you some coaching on it, too. All right. We're going to get into our main session. And I'd like to bring up Charlie Jonas. Charlie is, a, is the CTO at Callaway Cloud Consulting where he splits his time between developing internal systems, employee training, and as a technical architect. He maintains several open source projects, including VS Code Apex PMD, TS Force, and a handful of Apex utilities. Our moderator for this session is Jeremy Ross. Jeremy is a software engineer who has worked in the Salesforce space for 15 years. He's CTO at Elevation Solutions and a Salesforce MVP. Jeremy is co-host of the Gadacer podcast and an avid home brewer. Come on up, Jeremy. Take your seat on the far end there. Our first panelist is Lexis Hansen. Lexis is a software engineer at Salesforce working in the developer experience team in Trailhead. Day to day, she works in JavaScript and React, and she's worked on sites you might be familiar with, like the Salesforce Sample Gallery, Developer Centers, and API Explorer. Come on down. And our second panelist and the last member of our crew here is Matt Lacey, who I will uh, read his bio again. <laughs> Matt did our, our tab nine quick talk. He's also a panelist today. Uh, Matt is the co-founder and head of development at Proximity Insight, an ISV OEM partner providing in-store solutions for luxury retailers. Matt also code hosts the Sporadic Code Coverage podcast and is moderator on the Salesforce Stack Exchange. All right, so this is our main talk. It's gonna last about 75 minutes. We're gonna do 20, 25 minutes of Charlie sort of setting up the context for the conversation we're about to have together. And we'll get into our Q&A. Uh, Q&A will start with the panelists kind of starting with some questions they think you'd like to hear the answers to. Uh, and then as you feel inspired and you want to get involved, kind of come up to one of the two mics. We're working both mics. It's fine to be on either one. Uh, take some notes as you're listening to Charlie for things that you'd like to ask about. There's a lot of content in here. It's pretty dense. Uh, so be ready to, to say stuff. And then when we do start the conversation, uh, it's not just questions you ask that Charlie answers. Sometimes you might want to answer a question or just add some context and uh, color commentary or your experience doing something similar. Uh, feel free to just hop on a mic and say whatever comes to mind if you think that it contributes to the conversation. All right, without any further ado, take it away, Charlie. Awesome. Thank you for the uh, generous intro, Chuck. Um, so I'm pretty excited because today I get to show all of you the worst thing that I've ever built. Um, and the reason I'm excited is because I also get to show you what followed, which I think is probably the best application that I've built. Screen. So I think it's best to start at the beginning. And by the way, Chuck told me I couldn't have slides, so I just built the most massive diagram of all time, and we're just gonna go through this from start to end. <laughs> Sorry, Chuck. Um, so back in 2015, I was assigned to build a custom CPQ application. 
um, for an online advertising company. And at the time, we discussed the merits of building this as a client-side framework, but ultimately decided that we wanted to build it on platform, so in Visual Force. Um, we built this and released it, and this is pretty much what it looked like. A little less blurry, um, I had to hide some stuff, but um, basically you can manage the active subscriptions up here, renew and drop. Um, over here you can change the quantity, the unit price, all the standard quoting stuff. And then over here you'd be able to go to a new page to search for products and add them. So the client was pretty happy with that um, and we continued to build on it over the next couple months. Uh, the application remained pretty responsive but would get a little slower with each feature, but overall still pretty good. Um, there was this more fundamental issue though and that's that about 80% of all their sales were coming from less than 20% of their products. So the solution here was, was pretty straightforward. We were just gonna bundle a bunch of these low value or low performing products with the higher ones and sell them as a single item. Um, pretty good solution. And we did that and launched it. It was immediately um, successful, really high adoption rate. Um, but as a side effect, our view state exploded. And the reason is because before we would maybe have 10 to 20 products on a page, we are tracking the state for that, and now we are tracking upwards of 500 sometimes. So we immediately optimized for view state, which really had a, bad, a big impact on the responsiveness of the application. Um, basically, we moved things out of the cache, we had to do more work with every request. Um, still, it wasn't always enough. Like, there were still quotes that would break, so our solution was just to split those into two separate quotes and provision them, and that turned out to be a horrible idea because six months later, we had to start renewing these quotes that we had built, these mega quotes, and the application would just straight up crash when you opened it. It wouldn't even load. Um, so I, can, I actually have a video of this documenting the issue, probably hard to see, but um, I just tried to renew five products or seven products and it's taking eight seconds to complete. The big kicker is I'm trying here to change the quantity and watch how long that takes to go. So pretty bad, <laughs> not a great experience. Um, you can see the sales team's probably starting to get frustrated. Um, and then I just tried to go to add new products, and it, it, you probably didn't see that, but I basically crashed out with a CPU timeout. Um, so yeah, it looked like there were only a handful of products there, but really I'm having to track information, like inventory information for hundreds of products there, which is why it's so slow. Um, so I just refer to this time, this era of the tool as the bad times. <laughs> and um, this really was kind of becoming my life. I had been building this thing for a long time and it's you know turning into a dumpster fire basically. We're trying to optimize it but every time we go one way, we basically hit the other limit and it starts to become apparent that there's really just no way for our solution to support the amount of information that we need to in the page. Um, so it was at this point that I kind of took a step back and I really asked myself, if I was going to do all of this over again, what would I focus on? And three things kind of came into my head. Um, first and foremost, I would build it in something that was the most performance solution I could come up with. Um, second, I would make it more debuggable. If any of you have ever written Visual Force code, you know it's a nightmare to debug um, and to support. And then third, I would build, build it in whatever I could, or I would leverage tooling in a way to make me as productive as possible. And that was really because if you're going to rebuild something, you need to do it as fast as possible and as cheap as possible. Um, and I didn't have answers to this, so I started doing R&D, or into, into different things at the time. Um, I already knew that I, I really wanted TypeScript to be a part of this. I had, Ran TypeScript for like Apex PMD and some other stuff that I've been working on. And you know that feeling in JavaScript when you write like 300 lines of code, you deploy it and it just runs the first time? 
No, you probably don't know that feeling because it doesn't happen in, in JavaScript. But in TypeScript, it really does happen. It's kind of like they say it's a unit, your first level of unit test for your code. Um, so static type tracking is awesome in my book. Um, next, I needed to pick a UI framework or a front end framework. And when I compared kind of the options at the time, I was really drawn to React. It was kind of the Goldilocks solution. Um, and beyond that, it was known to be extremely performant. And then it had a great developer ecosystem. So um, I would be able to learn and, and leverage things that other people had built. Um, after picking up React or deciding on React, I, I quickly found Redux as well. Um, and Redux added a level of predictability to the application by giving us a global state management system. Um, and it, beyond that, it also has really amazing um, debug tooling that I hopefully can show you later. Um, for a component library, I went with AntD. It's really not important that I went with AntD. I think what matters here is I was going to leverage a component library to do all the heavy lifting with the UI stuff. I wasn't going to try to build everything from the ground up in HTML. Um, so I kind of had what the application was going to look like, but I still needed to figure out how to get it to work on Salesforce, and I wanted a seamless development experience. So this is kind of what I came up with. Um, basically, it's a hybrid NPM application alongside a Salesforce SFDX application. So up here, we have our source for the actual application, which is you know, TypeScript and less and you know, your node modules and all that stuff. And our build, when we build, we pass all that stuff into Webpack, which is a bundler. It takes all of our source and it spits out you know, one or two JavaScript files, which we then zip and then pass over to our DX application. From here, we can use Salesforce DX to then deploy it to whichever target we'd like. Um, <clears throat> and then there was one other thing that was a pet peeve of mine, and that was every time I would talk to Salesforce, which I was doing a lot in this application, I would kind of exit the TypeScript realm and lose all type safety. Um, so in what's probably the most questionable decision of this whole thing, I decided to write a lightweight ORM, um, and that kind of turned into TS Force, and basically what it does at the most fun, it does a lot of stuff now, but at the most fundamental level, it takes a configuration where you can, you can tell it which S objects are part of your model. It goes out to the tooling API, and then it builds TypeScript classes for those so that you can work with those as like first class members in your application. Um, yeah, so at this point, I've kind of finished doing research and I've you know, been learning these technologies and, and I have a pretty good idea how I want to build or how I would rebuild this thing. Um, it's worth noting that I'm replacing a Visual Force application with another Visual Force application, um, but just one that's only a couple lines of code. Um, so I still needed to convince the client that this was a good idea. And to do so, I basically built a prototype. The goal of this prototype was to simply prove beyond a reasonable doubt that this new framework would be able to handle basically anything we could throw at it. So I actually was able to rebuild this, and I just have a, a quick um, video of, of kind of what it looked like. So this is the actual prototype, and what I'm doing here is just showing that um, it can handle basically anything. Um, it just returned 1,400 results. I just set the page size to 100. Um, I'm doing some simple searching. And then <clears throat> what I did next is I kind of just started adding products to a page um, about 100 at a time. And I don't do it here, but in the actual demo, I think I added products until I hit like 4,000. Um, so there were now 4,000 products in our application. And I was able to still make changes without any noticeable uh, degradation. So they were pretty convinced. I think that if I hadn't had this and I said, let's rebuild this application we've been working on for two years, I think they would have laughed at me or fired me. I'm not sure. Um, luckily, I had this. And um, it, it worked. 
they decided they did want to move forward with the rebuild. So the next step was. Sorry, I have a quick question. Yeah, sure. Uh, you spent you spent, like, oh, okay. um, you spent a long time doing R and D on the on this prototype yeah. and trying to figure out a way to do it. How a did you convince things. like your team to, that you were going to be doing this? Um, so. First off, I this was all just me. Um, this wasn't a large project, so it was just something that I was working on. Um, and then I'm also the CTO at our company, and, and everybody at our company gets like 25% strategic time. I was spending way more than 25% strategic time, to be honest, but I was kind of like in save your own ass mode there at that point. So, um, and it was also enjoyable, you know, like working with these new technologies, you start working on something, you get pretty into it and stay up late and figure it out. Okay, cool, thank you. I got a quick question. Yeah. Um, what was the decision that went into going down the third party's framework as opposed to like going full lightning? Yeah, I knew this was gonna come quickly. <laughs> What's that? You wanna come back to that? Oh, no, ask it again later. Later. Yeah, we'll come back to that. I, that's, that's a good question and yeah. Um, so, Basically, we had sign off to move forward, and at this point, we needed to start kind of like figure out how we we're actually going to do this. Or I say we, I mean I. Um, the best part about rebuilding something is you know 100% of the requirements. They're written in code, so it's actually really easy. Like you can skip that whole discovery step. So the first thing I did was just categorize those by like what's core, what's kind of secondary, what's a quality of life feature so that I could kind of figure out where to start. Um, I also set some rules for the rewrite, um, and these will probably be controversial, but um, I wasn't gonna change the inputs or the outputs. Basically, there's an opportunity backing this, this application, and I wasn't gonna make any changes to what's on the opportunity or you know, how the, it writes to the opportunity. Um, I also wasn't gonna use any Apex at all, I just wanted to do everything via the REST API. Um, and then function over form, just you know, trying to get something out as fast as possible. Don't spend much time on the, the design aspects. Um, so to start, I decided I, to build a kind of a vertical slice of the application. And what I mean by that is I take a single scenario and I'm gonna build it end to end to completion. Um, and the reason for doing that is that you really get a chance to figure out any like technical challenges that might come up. Um, and then once you have solved those, you can kind of spider out horizontally and, and finish the application. So I, again, I was able to rebuild my, one of my really early builds. So we can take a look and see what that looked like here. Oh, I didn't mean to go full screen. Sorry. So, yeah, this was like the first build that did everything that this application should do um, end to end for a very narrow use case. Um, we can renew things, we can drop things, um, we can come over here and we can search for products, um, we can add them and you know do all the unit price and quantity and all this stuff. And then we can save and restore as well. Um, so I did come across some things, some technical issues during this process. Um, one of the big ones was that with the REST API at the time, there was actually no way to do batch. You had composite batch, which would give you a single round trip for multiple requests. Like, Oh, sorry, I mean batch DML. Um, so you could do composite batch, but when you did that, it actually still executed every record or every request you sent in its own context. So we're updating hundreds of records here at a time. That would be extremely slow. Um, you could use the bulk API, except you can't use the bulk API in a visual first page, or at least I couldn't figure out how to get it to work. It had some serious cores issues. Um, so basically, I broke my, my second rule and I wrote like an Apex REST resource which would allow me to do generic bulk DML. Um, another big thing that came up was state design is hard. 
Um, I wanted to use my like object-oriented brain and store all these objects in their full like computed capacity. But what I learned is that you really want to only store the minimal amount of information and then compute everything else um, in real time on the fly. And that seems like it would be super slow, but, but there's other ways that you can kind of cache that stuff and keep it highly performant. Um, cool, so back to the builds. Um, the next release that came out would be like the MVP or the next kind of milestone of this project. Um, and we can see it's starting to look a little bit more like the original tool. It's still pretty um, basic. We have some abilities to actually, you know, like set the term and things that you would need to do if you're going to sell somebody this, uh, these products. You can also send this application, or this, uh, sorry, you can send this quote. I think my favorite feature that I added at this point was this submit bug report. And essentially what this does would let somebody, you know, kind of report an issue to me. And once they type something in here and click submit, it will actually capture the current state of the application. And I just save it to an Apex object. And then I'll get like an email that says, hey, this issue was submitted. Um, and then I can go and check it out and I can open it up and it will it'll reopen the last state that that user was seeing at the time. Um, and maybe I can demo that later. So, kept working. I mean, the MVP was getting there, but still a little ways off. So this was actually the release that we first went live with. And you can see it's looking a lot better. In my opinion, it's better than the original tool in every single way. Um, and when we went live with this, everybody hated it. They like threw their arms up in there. They're like, this isn't what we're used to. And I was like, oh, you're not used to waiting or like things happening immediately. <laughs> um, so I think a lesson learned there is like people don't like change. So if you're going to change something, give them more preparation. We definitely failed in that aspect. Um, and you know, a couple weeks went by and, and they were, completely sold on it. They were extremely happy. So everything worked out well. So the kind of the final milestone of this project was feature parity. Um, that V1 release was still missing like a lot of the secondary features like multi-currency and, and things that were high value or like high effort but not used that often. So when we hit feature parity, I finally got to stop supporting both applications because all along the way, not only am I building this one application, but we're also supporting the old legacy version. Oh, my audio out. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Cool. Um, sorry about that. Um, so at this point, I got to delete about 5,000 lines of Apex and Visual Force, which is like the best feeling I've ever had, just like getting rid of it and getting rid of that part of my life. Um, so since release, Things have been going um, really well, and we've been continuing to extend it, but i really like to show you kind of some of the, the features that we built into this that, that make it um, really nice to work with and, and support. So this is the current version of the application. Um, oh, and actually, start my dev server real quick. So this is the current version of the application. And um, one of the really nice features I kind of teased earlier is the ability to reload the current state of the quote. So if I go to save this, I've hard coded in an exception. We'll see that I, I get an exception log ID. Basically, this would be what the user would see. And they would say, like, hey, I, um, and they could update that log with their information. Um, but so I can come over to, oh, get a, another tab open, sorry about that. I can come over to Salesforce and I can open up that log ID. And we can see it's, it's got some information about like what went wrong. I've got a stack trace, which is not very helpful because um, everything's like minified. Um, but it does give you some information. 
And I've got the exception that was actually thrown. I just have a, you know, throw new exception, delete me in the code somewhere. Um, what's really cool though is I can open an instance of this quote tool, and this, is, this isn't a save state anywhere. This is just the state of the application at the point on which it happened. So that's pretty nice. Um, oh, sorry about that. And then one of this, an experimental feature that I've been working on is actually capturing the session that they, the user was, or like recording the session uh, prior to the exception being thrown. So I can click this link. Um, and this will actually pull up a recorded version of what the user was seeing before the application crashed. Um, so yeah, I'm talking about stuff and I think I'll change the quantity to two here in a second at some point. <clears throat> and then I'll click save. So immediately you can see how beneficial this is. Like users are really bad at reporting what went wrong. Whenever they say something went wrong, they normally just start yelling at you and you're like, okay, can you give me more information? Um, in this case, we don't really need to. We kind of have everything we need right there. Um, so the other feature that's really nice, and this isn't something that I came up with, but something that I stole from, uh, I think, Kevin O'Hara, is all of these applications, or, th or this application basically the way you develop it is with a local dev server. So I can come in here and just change local to one. And basically, it's going to swap out my static resource that's saved on the site with just whatever my local dev instance of this application. And what that allows me to do is make changes in real time against whatever org I want. So like, imagine this is a production org. I can come in and start making changes I can save. You'll see that immediately those, those reflect, and they don't even I don't even lose the state of the application as I'm doing this. Um, that's obviously really powerful for reproducing things because one of the hardest things is always to take something from production and try to reproduce it in a sandbox. Um, so that really saves you from having to do that step, and obviously this is only changing for me. Um, so another really nice thing is after I fix the bug, like let's say I came into the save actions and I found, I found the error and I, I fixed the bug and I'm ready to deploy it and have the user test it. Um, basically what I can do is I, in my package.json, I can set the name of the static resource via this resource field. So whatever I change this to, that will be the resource that gets deployed. So basically, I'll change quote broken to quote fixed. And then if we look at the page, there's this really, I mean, this is so simple, but so powerful. There's this, um, basically this line of code where the resource version is pulled dynamically from a custom setting. So basically the app is, is the version of the app that we load is just controlled by a custom setting. So if I come back over, if I can find a, a tab, and I go to my custom settings. I can spell. And then I go to manage. You can see that right now, everybody is on quote broken, except for this profile, which you know maybe this is a beta test group, and they're on quote five RC. So I could change everybody back to quote fixed, or maybe I just want to turn it on for that one user. So I could just create a new custom record for that one user, and then um, save that, and they would immediately be put onto the new version of the tool. Um, so that's obviously really powerful for like rollbacks and you know release management, all that type of stuff. Um, so yeah, that's basically everything that I wanted to show you. I know that was a blur. <laughs> um, questions? So, Different. why the uh, third party frameworks and not Lightning? Oh. Yeah, um, absolutely. So, if we go back to the timeline, let's just scroll back. So, let's think about when this was. This was April, kind of like 
March, April-ish when I started to do this. And if you recall at the time, it was, first off, it, it wasn't Lightning Web Components, it was just Aurora. And there were some serious performance issues that people were reporting. I honestly hadn't built anything uh, production work likewise in line, or, uh, Aurora, so I can't really speak to that. But I can say I just spent like almost two years of my life getting burned by the platform. So I was a little bit hesitant to like jump on board to the next thing. Um, it turned out to be really nice because I think now Aurora's been replaced by Lightning Web Components and um, people are still building with React on Salesforce, I think. All right, well, first of all, I just want to say, Charlie, that an amazing, uh, amazing solution, really cool stuff. So uh, quick round of applause. And what we'll do now is um, we'll start with a panel, um, ask a few questions, give these guys a chance to warm things up, get your, get your question brain juices going, um, and then we'll come back to you guys. And we can just, you'll come up to the microphone when you have questions, and we can, we can get everyone's questions answered. But uh, panel, who would like to go first? Sure. Um, obviously, performance was top of mind as you were kind of putting together the stack that you were going with. You showed the image with Angular and Vue as well. So did you go into some of the intricacies of the way those work under the hood, like their diffing algorithms, and kind of use some of that to inform your decision of which library you went with there? Yeah, I mean, as far as deciding between the three, like Angular, Vue, or React, I didn't do like any benchmarking or anything like that. I had used Angular one, like 1.0 or whatever it was. And I actually really liked it, but when I started learning Angular 2, it was like pretty hard to comprehend. And then Vue was kind of the opposite, where it was super lightweight, but I was a little worried that building a large application, you might get like kind of, you might start to just fall apart with all the different choices that you had to make by not having that kind of structure. So that's really the only part that I took into consideration when deciding between the three, but I think it was already kind of proven just by the nature of where React is used by other applications that it does scale well and that it is fast. So I didn't do any like official benchmarking now. So I've got a question about the platform side of things. Um, you said you had to write some Apex, you had to do that bulk generic. Yeah. Like upset and so what I've had to do that same one before, same reasons. Uh, and then you deleted 5,000 odd lines of Apex Visual Force. Yeah. Is there no business logic in code on the platform anymore? Like, yeah, does that every, come with any costs? And so there are other processes that could have leveraged the same code if it was still there? Yeah, I think there definitely are, there is some cost with that. And, and I've seen that particularly in like them being not able, like if a product has a really complicated inventory model, which some of these do, like them not being able to see that inventory without opening up the quote tool and looking at it there. Um, and I think our solution has been to just package those parts in a NPM module and then just create a separate React app, which is work, works pretty well, honestly. Um, but as far as like, rewriting the thing, I really didn't want to like start with the original Apex because I thought that I would end up with the same solution if I did that. Um, and then also Apex development is just kind of slow, so I, I really didn't like want to do a lot of it if I didn't have to. Yeah, uh, was there a, is there a testing framework around this then? Yeah, um, it's currently broken, or a lot of my tests are <laughs> broken, but it's running Jest. Um, I think all my tests are broken right now. This is a, this is a little bit of a different build that I, I put together to get it to run on a developer org. So yeah, some passed. 37 passed, woo. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, I didn't, and I didn't go into like testing the UI. Like I know with Jest, you can actually like test React. I didn't do that. I kind of drew a boundary and I said, I really wanna test the complicated stuff like the inventory model and uh, the reducers and all that stuff, state management wise. I was gonna ask about state management next, so that's a good lead in. Um, what was your experience walking into Redux and like a global store? And if you had to tell people the benefits or the drawbacks of that, what would you say? Yeah, I actually have a diagram for this. <laughs> <laughs> um, the Redux is great. It's also really heavyweight. Like if I was, I think I've written about 10 of these applications now that all kind of use the same 
framework. It's actually like open source, um, the, the base kind of starter for this project. But the problem with Redux is it, is it really is heavyweight and lightweight in terms of actual like size of application, but it, you, when you start going down that road, you're committed and you really have to like hold towards the, the paradigm of, of doing things the flux way, which means you have basically this is, this is what our state looks like for the application. Um, we have our global state and then it would be split into slices. So um, basically, you know, we have like our account state and our opportunity state and then the line item state and then that's split further into like new line items versus renewed and dropped. Um, and that kind of goes on as many levels as you need it to. But one of the challenges with this way is when you're updating the state, you don't have access to the other parts of the state. So everything you need has to come from your actions. Um, and I know if you're not familiar with, with Redux, this is probably a lot, but basically Redux is a single state, like single global state, and then every update is made through an action, and you can't mutate your state when you're doing this. Like you can't just say, oh, this value was three, now I wanna change it to four. You have to recreate your entire state over again, um, and that immut the immutability is actually extremely important because whenever your application is going to render, it then just has to say, does this object equal the old object? And if the answer is no, it knows to re-render versus trying to like actually compare like all of the different values and see if it actually is a, a match of the application. Did you use Redux DevTools? What's that? Did you use the Redux oh, DevTools? Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's a good, um, Good demo as well, which is really cool. So let me just open. I like them, that's why I asked. Oh, I don't know. Cool, so what's really cool about Redux is, I mean, other than having all of your state in one place, which allows you to do some of the, you know, um, reloading of the application I showed earlier, is, um, I just do some actions and every one of these actions that I'm doing is sending off a Redux action. You can see they're kind of coming down through here. Um, the DevTools is extremely nice because it allows you to inspect the actions as they come through. So, you know, if I look at that renew sponsorship object, then we can see it has a type and then I can see all the product information associated with it. Um, and then I can see how the state has changed as a result of that action. And we can see, you know, whenever I've, whenever I go from drop to renewed, it's going to remove this product from the drop product state and add it to the renewed product state. Um, but then even cooler, I can actually replay these actions. So if I just start stepping back through the state, you can see all of the different things that I've done are just replaying back and forth. So. Um, obviously, that's insanely powerful, like when you find a bug, to just sit there and go back and forth, back and forth until you figure out what's going on. And you, you put that, that's the state you're putting in those bug reports that the users submit to you, right? So then you can load that same state up in your... No, instance. but I wish I was. <laughs> so if I could redo that feature, like right now I'm just capturing the overall state like one time, which is basically, you know, this object serialized. Yep. Um, but if I could redo it, what I would do is instead capture all of the actions that had been created, and then I could just replay those actions, and that would give me the ability to just do like the exact th same thing. And I really wouldn't need that like replay functionality that I showed earlier, yep. which is kind of, I don't know if I'll actually go live with that, honestly. Um, but yeah, that's a really good point. Can you talk about the this bulk REST API thing that you created? Most importantly, did you open source it? Uh, no, I didn't, because actually, I, I didn't mention, but about two months after we launched, they came out with Composite Collections, and basically Composite Collections was what I needed before I started with the, uh, the REST bulk API. Um, the REST resource, it was a bad idea, honestly. It didn't, like, it didn't, handle user permissions or like field level security and all that stuff and I was really happy to be able to delete that code as well. So did you go to the, the, the new 
um, collection API? Yeah, so this version is running the collection API. Now, the collection API, it, it, everything, everything in, the, in the request has to be of the same type, is that correct? That, that is true, okay. and honestly, to speak towards that, I think like my save process is, is not optimized at all, neither is the load process. Basically, it's just like fires off like 50 different queries, but like you saw how fast it's still loaded. So what gives me hope about this application is even though it's not optimized yet, there's lots of room to optimize if you ever needed to. Um, and yeah, the, uh, you do have to save everything at once, but I'm really only saving two objects, and that's the opportunity and then opportunity line items. All right, well, let's, uh, let's go ahead and open it up to the audience. Um, if you guys have questions, please step up to a microphone. I know you guys have questions. I brought a list. <laughs> First of all, thank you for the demo. It's been, it's great. Um, I did have a question. For the bug reporting, you built all that in Salesforce? Sorry, what was that? For the bug reporting you have, the feature where <clears throat> you're saving it all to Salesforce, it's not? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's just a single object that has a handful of fields. Um, and at first, I was actually storing the state in just like text fields. But I then realized I could just sort them as attachments. So you can see, like, here's the replay that I showed, and then here's just the application state. And if we download that, that's just like a big JSON file, um, probably a massive JSON file. And then, you know, I have like some simple reporting set up on this that will just tell me, like, if we start, I, I have it silenced because there's definitely some background noise. Like, we'll get a couple a day, but if there's ever more than like two or three, then I have it email me and tell me that something's wrong, and then I can go and start checking and see if everything's running properly. Okay. And the dev server, that's just the React server that you get with the um, Create React app? Yeah, great question. This is a Webpack dev server, so the okay. same build tool that packages everything up also has a really awesome um, dev server, and that's what it allows you to do the hot reloading. So basically, like, when I save, when I was showing you, you know, I save something and it updates immediately without changing the state, that's because it's doing incremental builds, and then it just swaps that single React component out. So instead of rebuilding your entire application, most of the time it can just say, hey, you changed the bug report component, so just give me the new bug report component. Okay. And then in regards to the global store, have you encountered any issues where you've been treating it more like a giant global variable soup that you ne don't necessarily treat? Yeah. There's, yeah, I mean, you, you want to avoid just creating, like, one big getter and setter. Like, your actions, I mean, there's more to state design than we can get into here, but your actions should really, like, represent the action that you're doing. And what's nice about Redux is, you know, more than one reducer can respond to a single action. So, like, different parts of your state get the same action, and then they decide how they update independently. Um, what I would say is there's this, the thing that really clicked for me is, um, if, we look at, if we look at this, um, basically your state should be as simple as possible, but then you use selectors. What's a mem it's called a memorized selector because the input and the output are cached. And when you do that, you basically take all of your really simple state and you build a very complex like, state out of that, and then that's what your UI uses and then your UI dispatches that same state back to your reducers in action. So like, if one reducer needs access to data and another reducer, then that would happen via the selector and then your component kind of passing what it thinks it needs to it. Okay, cool, thank you. Yeah. Hey, um, the bug replay that you had shown yeah. was really sweet. How does that work, actually? Uh, it's so simple. It's like three lines of code. Um, RRWeb is just this framework that popped up on Hacker News one day, and I was like, hey, that's pretty cool. I think I could put that in my application. Um, but basically, you just set it up to record, and I don't know the actual details of how it works. So it's, it's doing something with, like, um, HTML window events, and it's recording, like, I think the mouse moving. And click. Um, yeah, and then basically it's just storing the data about that, and it, um, it then rebuilds that. 
So um, let's see where this. Does that work with touch events as well? I haven't tested it. I have to find out. Yeah, the application <laughs> does render pretty well in a, um, in a mobile device, but that hasn't been anything that I've, we, we don't really support that. Um, so yeah, you can see I just require RR web, and then I just like call this record method. And then basically you just, every time a recording event happens, you just are, I'm just storing it in this events matrix, and then I can, whenever an exception happens, I can dump it um, into the, the attachment. Awesome, thanks. Um, yeah. Um, this is really cool. I'm excited about it. Uh, so I did a, I do wonder why you went with like the REST API versus something like remote actions or remote objects, that kind of thing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, basically just because I didn't have to write any extra code and I had like, I could maintain everything in one project. Um, we've, I've done this application kind of framework for a couple other apps and especially if it's like public, you, you wanna go the other route. You wanna create like very defined web services to support your application. But because I can trust my users, I can put pretty much all of the application logic in this application. Um, and it's easier to test, I think, in, in, when it's done that way. But like, I mean, you wouldn't wanna do this for a public application where like they can, you know, then you kind of have to, would have to create your your validation layer twice because like somebody could start mucking around with JavaScript and, and set up like incorrect stuff. But um, for this purposes, like if a sales user starts, you know, overriding the inventory, then we'll just be like, stop, don't do that. <laughs> you know? Cool. Well, awesome project. I, I've had a similar experience in my past where we had a behemoth visual force page, one app page, and ran into view state issues. And what we ended up doing was going to remote actions. And then also, then we started going down that path. It's like to componentization. We're all doing this in visual force. Mm -hmm. um, and we'd start passing events back and forth instead of one thing owning the whole state. So were you storing stuff? Like, were you storing data on the browser, or on the user's browser, so that you could then pass it back later? Through the remote action, yeah, if something qualified enough to change the state. Yeah, yeah, I, I considered that. When I went to the client, I actually laid out that as an option, is instead of trying to rewrite the whole thing, we could try to just offload parts of the application to the browser, um, but, I was hoping they wouldn't go that route because I think it gets pretty complicated when you do that and then you're still kind of dealing with the same issues at some level. Um, but yeah, how did that work for you? Oh, really good. Thanks. How many remote actions do you have out of interest? Jeez, it was a while. Um, I don't know, a good two dozen. Yeah, oh, okay, that's not too bad then. Yeah. I've got a single page app that's more legacy JavaScript, like it, I made decisions around 2015, so it's kind of too early to take on React and other things. Um, and I use remoting. We actually have probably 50-50 split roughly of JavaScript Apex. And we're an ISV partner. I actually want the, all the Apex. I want that protected. That's our IP, and the clients can't access it. But yeah, the downside of remoting is I have one Apex class that's currently about 2,000 lines of code that it's just stubs calling into other pieces, but it's, it's getting pretty unwieldy in places. Have either of you guys used like invocable methods for that same? I, wanna, I do want to sort of switch to that. I just, Those I don't know about anyone else on the platform, but they keep releasing new stuff so fast where you've got your head down doing other things that, you know, I'm always about two years behind on my feature adoption, I think. Yeah, what was fun is we ended up going into an Angular app and we made a request framework. So we had like one visual force page where the controller was just a generic Apex remote action, but you would say, hey, what class would be like your request class? And it would, just to really componentize the remote, instead of having a separate remote action, we would have, we mimicked rest. There's a get, pose, put. Yeah, that's really cool, I like that, it's a good idea. Cool. That's cool. Hey, can you give a little bit more understanding on what it means for your app to start up? Uh, a little bit more around what queries you're running and 
Have you optimized like time to paint, how quickly you can get something on screen? Are you optimizing the order that you're loading stuff, trying to just make it feel faster for users? <clears throat> I have not done a single line of optimization on this. Um, it, I really haven't needed to, or I haven't felt like I needed to. Um, if we look at the network tab, it's going to be embarrassing. <laughs> oh, the breakpoint. So, yeah, it just made like 35 queries. Um, it seems fine, I don't know. I mean, if I ever needed to have things happen faster, the options would be to like maybe output some data in the visual force page directly, which is always an option, but probably wouldn't be faster, actually. Um, My application makes pr probably a similar number of requests. Yeah. Maybe slightly more all via remoting, but again, the, the speed to load it, it's like, negligible. Yeah, I, I think um, that if you re like, I could probably delay some of these requests from happening until I need them. Um, or try, I mean, what's really inefficient about this application is the state. Um, I'm, when I query like a product, if there's a, um, if there's like a region associated with that, I query it multiple times for every query I make, and then I'm storing it like every single time. So you'll have related objects that get stored like a thousand times, which is not good. But again, it hasn't been an issue, so I haven't fixed it. Thank you. Hi there. Uh, this was a great talk, really. Um, I think you have some really creative uh, designs and solutions here. Um, I, I don't have any experience developing in this way on Salesforce, so it was really interesting for me particularly. My, my question um, kind of comes from, have you had a requirement where you've used this solution and having two different applications on the same page? And what, what I'm kind of picturing in my mind is we have like a you know lightning record page or it could just be a classic record page with the record details down the middle and then a few different widgets kind of along the page that all need to share this central global state? Yeah, I have not done that. Okay. What I have done is like embedded this in a lightning page or like had it in um, a classic page as like a visual force component and that works well. Um, you would have to wire something up to let them share state, I think. Um, Redux really wants to have a single state for everything, so I'm not sure how that'll look. It'll be interesting to, to mess around with it, though. Cool, yeah, I was curious, thank you. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> we got kind of a, a couple things. On the state management that we were just talking about, we saw the 30 queries or something, Is actually building a, a new state for Redux with, when each query arrives, or are they sort of compiled and then you get one Redux slice? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so I have a load action, and this is embarrassing, honestly. Um, so this, I also want to point out that this is the first time I used any of these technologies. So if, when I go back and look at my code, I'm, I'm horrified a little bit. Um, but basically, when I start loading, I just dispatch like, um, uh, an async action, which basically tells the, the application to block the UI and show that loading spinner. And then it just goes through and it just makes a ton of queries. Um, and it builds, it waits till all those queries have responded and then it dispatches a single action at the end. You can see this is just compiling like pretty much all of the application initial state and then it dispatches that in a single action and then dispatches one more action to stop showing the, the um, UI. I mean, I like that because it keeps your state history cleaner. Yeah, and states kind of, there's kind of two types of state too, right? There's like the state that you load and it never changes again, and that would be like account details. Like this application isn't changing account information, so it's technically state, but it's kind of static. And then there's the stuff that you know, like the line item information, you're changing that, you know, as, as you save and, and update and make changes. Would you, would you differentiate those two in your state design? Like things that are mutable and things that are not? Yeah, I mean, well, it's all immutable, but it actually makes a big impact how you design it. Like for the account information, I can just go out and query all of the related information and store that as like an S object that spiders out into other S objects. 
but you don't want to do that for anything you're updating often because it's really hard to update um, those like deep relationships with an immutable in an immutable way. So whenever you get into things that you're updating a lot, you want to go with a flat structure, and it's almost like a, a relational database where you would have like a key value pair, or like not key value, but you'd have like the ID of that object, and then you would have all of its flat fields. And then if it references anything else, you just want to store the ID that it references. All right, I'm gonna let him ask a question. I have another one. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, so I was, so you talked a little bit about why you chose this at the time, and I'm curious if maybe you, you may not have enough experience with Lightning Web Components, or if anybody else does, like, would you do this again now? Like, today, if you were to start over, would you, would you use the same technology, or would you investigate using LWC? Um, I think I would do the same. I'm really happy with React. If anybody's looking for a React developer. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, I've done a little bit with Lightning Web Components, and I will say they're a huge step in the right direction from Aurora. I like them about a million times better. Um, really, the only problem I have with them is how they get mounted into the application and how your project is set up with them. I don't feel like you have quite the control to break them out and use different directories and, you know, really, I feel like at the end of the day, you still end up with this big flat list of uh, Lightning Web Components, and that's really what bothers me most about them. Also, it's not really easy to use TypeScript with them, um, which is a big deal to me. And then up until I think like yesterday, you couldn't really have a local build for that. Like this, I can run this locally, and in fact, when I first started this, it only ran locally, and I just set up like um, cores for local host. And the first like six months that I built this application, it was only a local run, or not six months, first like three months, it was just a local application. Well, Dan actually kind of led into the next thing I want to talk about, um, which is sort of Salesforce features versus this kind of compare and contrast stuff. Um, so for context here, I live and breathe Salesforce these days. I haven't really done anything off-platform in a long time. The last time I did like native JavaScript stuff was ext.js in 2010. Uh, so sometimes I see presentations like this and I just go, oh man, things are so nice elsewhere, right? Like the state management stuff and the replay stuff, it's like, wow, now Lightning Web Components don't feel as shiny. Um, but I live in the platform, right? I, I couldn't go this far kind of out, I think. So when I listen to a talk like this, I'm thinking, how could I take parts of this that are amazing and do it with Salesforce stuff, right? Lightning Web Components, you know, could I mash this stuff up? So are there parts of this you could even imagine sort of picking out and mashing up into like an Aura or a Lightning Web Component? Yeah. App? And like, where would you even start and what pieces are salvageable or reusable? What I, what I would say is the unidirectional data flow that you get with React, I would build that into Lightning Web Components. And I know that it's already possible, but I'm trying to think how I can explain that better. But basically letting your application render the same way every single time a certain, you get a certain state is kind of the React way. And I think you can still do that more or less with Lightning Web Components. Um, and then I think I've seen people use Redux in Lightning, or in Aurora. Really? Yeah, I, I've seen it. They like, they, if they do that, they heavily use JavaScript static resources. And then they kind of tie that into Aura. But a lot of like, the logic and state management is in the static resource. And Aura is more just like UI representations. Yeah, I mean, I think I, I'm really tied to this idea of the unidirectional data flow. And, and I have toyed around with that in Lightning Web Components, but I haven't taken it far enough to know like if it really works at more than just like a single component level. OK. This is a bigger question than for right now. But what I'm really thinking right now is could I take Lightning Web Components and data service, but get the kind of auditing that I love from this application, right? Like the, the very clear state management. I think that like the idea of dumping your state and reloading it, like whenever an exception occurs, like the ability to dump the state and reload it, you could probably build that into anything. I don't think that's necessarily specific 
to React. You just might have to do more setup along the way. Like when you get that new state, you might have to run some actions or fire some events. Whereas the whole application is the state and it just responds to that state in this scenario. I suppose you could kind of create your own artificial mirroring of what Redux is doing, right? Where like an, act, like an action or a function is being called and then you're updating some part of your store. Um, so that, that could be, I guess, a yeah. way to, to cheat it. Um, ironically, even though I work at Salesforce, I work almost completely off platform. So this is the kind of stack I usually work in pretty regularly. Um, I'm curious. I know you mentioned you'd used some of these tools before, but between this whole stack, which of these things had like the biggest onboarding process or was the hairiest thing for you to kind of rock when you first started with it? Um, definitely, I think, uh, dependency management. <laughs> it, it's the hardest part of, of everything is, I think, just getting everything to work. The, the only recommend like the only reason I wouldn't recommend somebody going out and redoing all of this from the start is that it's hard to get all these different things to like work together the right way, and especially if you're like me and every time a new release comes out, you like try to jump on that newest version, it just ends up you break your builds all the time, and um, I think that part of like learning, you want to lock your dependencies so that they don't auto upgrade on you because that gives you a reproducible build. Like, you don't want to just wake up one morning and, and run your install command and all of a sudden your application isn't working. Obviously, is a bad thing. Um, and then beyond that, I think function, like this is all kind of functional programming more than object-oriented. And if you're coming from the object-oriented world, it will take a little bit to like make that switch in your brain. You said you're up to speed with TypeScript before you started this because you specifically wanted to use TypeScript. Mm -hmm. How was the learning process for that? Is that like a big changeover? For if you were just a JavaScript developer, I would say it would be a, a very big change. I mean, not really. Technically, TypeScript will run the original. Like, you can take a JavaScript file and change it to TS, and it will run fine. Um, you won't have any benefits of it. But um, if you come from like an Apex world where you have where you're used to statically typing things. Um, you'll be fine. If you come from like a C sharp world or, or a language where you have generics and stuff like that, it'll be even easier. Um, I think the TypeScript uh, typing language or whatever it is, is the best there is of everything I've used. Um, it's very powerful. You can do things that you didn't realize was possible with statically typed languages. And can you still be flexible when you need to? I mean, because oh, yeah. like I'm a big fan of static typing, having done quite a lot of JavaScript. Um, but then every time I'm using a fully static language and doing something in Apex, for, if you, as soon as you're trying to ingest like a big chunk of JSON, yeah, I just can't be bothered printing all these <clears throat> classes to pass it all out. Yeah, so it has things like uh, union types, and then you can discriminate them back out. So you can say that. If you think about like the classic file folder, like or file directory, like those two things are kind of the same, but they're kind of different. And if I just wanted to store a list of both of them, you know, they have different structures. So like a file might have an extension, a directory doesn't. So you could define a type that is either file or directory, and then when you go to use it, you just Run, like, run a quick check to say, is this a file or is this a directory? And then you get all of the properties that are associated with either of those. Is that very, very similar to like a union in C? So yeah, exactly. Um, and then also it has really nice like index typing. So this is uh, a static query, or this is how TS Force generates queries. And um, it's nice because it gives you, I'm just going off page here, just delete some stuff. Um, it gives you code complete on everything you have, but what's really cool, this might be hard to see, is like I can go up a parent. I can go, so I'm, I'm building a query off the account, and I have this query resolver, which basically just gives me access to all the API names, but I can go and select a parent of that. Uh, so like I've created last modified master record owner. I can select, um, let's see, I don't know if I can go multiple off of this, but, and then I can run a select query off of that, and now I have the fields of that parent object. So it's, it's smart enough to know that TypeScript allows you to say like, okay, this field is a type of a contact, or a type of a user, 
and then you can pass that into the next, like, you can basically reassign that, so it's very dynamic. That's cool. A lot of libraries that you might use will also have types associated to them that you can import, so it's really nice that you'll automatically get that support yeah. by including those, too. Yeah, I mean, that was one of the challenges, is when I was doing this, TypeScript was still pretty new, and a lot of libraries did not have accurate types. So <laughs> I would spend, like, a lot of time just getting my types to compile, which is definitely counterproductive. But these days, it's, I mean, it's so easy. Like, almost everything works. Did you say TypeScript doesn't work with lightning load components, or it's difficult? Well, you just have to, uh, basically, you just have a build step, and then you just output your JavaScript into the web component. I mean, same way it kind of works here, where we just pass it to a static resource. The real challenge is that lightning web components then mount your files, so like you might pass it like a file and on line 68 it says it does this, but whenever it actually runs on Salesforce, it's like wrapped in a bunch of code, so you, you lose your source maps, which I think is a deal breaker for me at least. Like you really wanna be able to say this is my original code and this is where that line maps up. Because um, when you load the Chrome debugger, it will automatically make that translation for you. Okay, uh, random question. Are you charged API limits when you're calling that REST API from your app? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, um, but just in this org, that didn't matter. Like there weren't that many users doing I think that. They much get like that. half a million, and we, even with a bunch of other integrations running, we never really break a hundred thousand. So um, they're pretty in in the realm of how far you can leverage API limits. They're pretty pretty mild. I think there's like seventy users using this application now. I know earlier you talked about being able to trust your users, so you're not really at a point where you're considering locking down their security to take away their API access in any near, near term. No, um, that would change things for sure. I think, I don't know what you would do at that point. You kind of shut this solution off. Um, are you talking about like turning off API access, API access altogether or just? Yeah, maybe for some of those users and saying, you can't do this thing, you can't see that thing. Yeah, I mean, the way I've always looked at it, if you have field level security to do it via the UI, then it's not really a security risk to open the API up to them, other than the fact that they could like script something to export a bunch of data. But if you've done a good job with your permissions elsewhere, then it's not a big deal. Um, that was one area that I thought I might have to run some Apex or like write a different web service if I needed to leverage an object that the end user didn't have access to. Um, that would have been one of the things that I would have had to break that rule for. Yeah. My actual question is more along the lines of, is it sounds like it's part of this and part of this big effort. You've had to write a lot of tooling. You've had to build up a lot of stuff to make this work. Um, what do you see in terms of the value there? You talked about using that in a few different apps. Can you talk about just some of the other benefits you've gained from that? How much tooling you've had to build, what the scope of that is? Yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, the amount is not so great. It's just all the steps to get there. like you know, figuring it out, but like the amount of stuff that's out there, other than, than TS Force, which I've already said is a questionable decision, um, it's really not a ton. It's, it's been a massive investment on my time, but one that personally I mostly enjoyed doing, I think I had become kind of bored with the platform and a little bit upset at where I was when this application started crashing, so it was, it was almost like an escape for me of like, oh, I get to use these new things and this is, yeah, this is fun again, you know? So it was a big personal investment. Like obviously I'm a consultant and we did not build the client for any of the R&D stuff that we put together. That, that prototype you built to get them over the line with the idea, did you just throw that away completely? Um, I mean, you said you've got that sort of basic framework you use for a few <clears throat> apps now. Yeah, it's, it was like the first version of, of what I, called the Bass stack, which is just all of these things kind of as a starter. Um, and I, I did throw it away as opposed to like using that as the start of the application just because it was so hacked. Like I yeah. just put it together as fast as I could. Um, and luckily I was able to find, I did push it remotely, which I was surprised. So I was able to find it and rebuild it. Cool. I was wondering when you started using or where does TS Force get the type definition files for the Apex objects? Um, just from the meta or from the tooling API. 
So I can actually show you what that looks like. If I just um, run npm run, uh, I've just got, basically I'm using npm build scripts to manage like all the development type stuff, but I've got a command that will just generate my classes. And I think I've got like 20 or 30 different objects in here, and it just goes out and it starts grabbing the files and it generates them. Does it do custom objects as well? Yeah, it's the, a lot, most of these are custom objects. It actually does, meta, or it does um, <coughs> metadata types as well and uh, platform events. Um, and it does relationships. So if I pull just accounts, then the resulting object will just have like um, owner ID. But if I pull accounts and users, then the resulting account object will have owner ID, but it'll also have owner, which is a reference to the, the actual user. So like you could do a related query and then you could just say like, um, you know, I could just say like, uh, owner and I have owner and owner ID. And then from owner I could go, I don't know if there's another, yeah, here's another related object which is a list, and then I could go like into that list and start um, indexing into the different fields there. Oh, nice. Yeah, so it, and it, it also, one of the nice things is it makes everything JavaScript-y, or like, you know, like you would hate to open your beautiful TypeScript code and then see like underscore, underscore C. So it just maps all those field names for you um, and lets you control that mapping if you need to so that you can get like, if somebody creates a name underscore, under, or underscore C field, you can map it to something else. Oh, that's neat. And then I had another question about the local equals one. You said you got that idea from someone else, but I hadn't seen it before. Could you show us how that works? Yeah, so Kevin O'Hara, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. Kevin O'Hara um, did a presentation back in, I think like Dreamforce 15, and he was just using it for like a single static resource file, like, you know, like CSS file or something like that. Um, in this case, it's our entire application is contained in these two files. Um, and what it does is if I set the local parameter to one, then it just goes to localhost. I've also got a backup custom setting in place that will allow me to like prevent people who I don't want having the ability to do localhost mode. I mean, it's not really a concern, but it's just nice to have that extra. I'm trying to look at why I haven't done this yet, but. Does it, <laughs> does it have any issues with like cross-site? Uh, no, because I'm developing on Salesforce. So like when I develop, I open up a, the, self, the application on Salesforce, yeah. and I set local equals to one, and now I'm just, this is my like, you know, this is my application that's running locally, so oh. I just do everything here, and I get the same benefits of hot reloading where it like just swaps out everything immediately. Okay. That part was very hard to get to work. <laughs> Thanks. I actually have a question that's a little bit outside of what you've shown, but you have another project that's around environment variables. And I'm wondering how you might use that now. Um, and for anyone not connected, maybe you can explain what that project is, what its goals are. But I wonder where, how you would use that to replace some of your custom settings and things now. I think I would keep my custom settings because they're hierarchical and they allow you to do the really nice things like say for this profile or just for this user, but then it has the fallback. Um, what I do, would do is replace, and I actually have done this now, is I replace all the custom labels because I was using custom labels to do like, you know, um, like those ty same types of things before. And there's actually no way to get custom labels with the REST API. So I had a huge hack where basically you create a REST resource and then a visual force page and then you like output the custom label and the REST resource is JSON. It was, it was bad. I um, actually do that, but it's, we have to support localization. Yeah. And they can switch language on the fly, but yeah, we dump a big JSON. That makes a lot of sense for like actually using it for the purposes of labels. Like <laughs> it works well for that purpose, but like when you're doing all that just to have an environmental variable, then you're kind of like, um, <clears throat> and to that point, the UI for that, which I'm about to release like a really nice shiny new version is all this as well. It's running the same thing. 
I've got a question just to, if we can go back to like that, that process you went through of, of um, I guess, trying to determine whether you were going to do a rewrite, right? And probably those conversations with a client probably were not very fun, I would imagine. No. Um, and, you know, because I think the, the modern wisdom on rewrites is nowadays is they're usually a bad idea because they, they have a pretty low success rate, actually. Yeah. Um, and it's better just to kind of patch along with what you have and move on to better things. Um, obviously, you guys had a, a little bit more of a crisis situation. So, you know, maybe you didn't, you didn't have the option to not do a rewrite. But um, maybe just talk about, like, what those criteria were for you guys and, and just, again, how you handle that with your client. And also, I'm, you know, I'm just curious, talk as much as you want or can, but, you know, when it came to pitching this idea to them, I mean, um, how, how were they in terms of like, okay, yeah, we'll pay for this again, or just how did that, as a, as a consultant, I'm kind of interested in that consultant aspect yeah. of it. <clears throat> yeah, absolutely. Um, I kind of glossed over that because it wasn't comfortable. It was like really awkward, um, but, this application in particular drives almost every single dollar that this organization receives, um, almost re originates with this application. So the need for it was really there. Like, I think we could have maybe gotten the old application to a place where it worked, but like, that wasn't good enough. They wanted to keep building on it. They wanted, to, like, they wanted it to be the best you know, experience for their sales staff. So I think it was, it was not a fun conversation. Um, luckily, I had, this wasn't the only project, only work that I had done for them. I had, at, along the same time, developed about probably nine or 10 other small projects, which were just like Apex type stuff. And all of those had gone really well. So like our, my CEO always talks about like this trust bucket that you have with your clients where like they'll trust you as long as you've been doing a really good job. and. I had a pretty good relationship with the project manager, so I kind of went to him and I was like, hey man, I know you don't want to hear this, but like, this thing is going to explode one day or stop working at some point, pretty much all together. So like, we should just consider what that would look like. Um, and I laid out kind of like all the different options as far as like, I was very upfront about cost, like to rewrite this whole thing is gonna be really expensive, um, but I still think it only ended up costing about a fourth or a fifth of the time that we had invested in the other tool. So if you compare that to like how much money we were just dumping into these view state optimizations here, it really wasn't like tremendous. And I think, I mean, I don't know, like what is the life cycle of software these days? Hopefully this lasts for another five years, but you know, two years, it's not great, but it's not the worst I've ever heard of. We are rapidly running out of time, so if anyone has uh, a final question, now would be the time. All right, well, if not, let's wrap it up. Um, thanks, panel. Thanks, Charlie. Really good job, amazing solution. Thank you, Chuck. Thanks, guys.